Hello, everyone. Welcome to Season 2, Episode 6 of the Helping Children Learn podcast here at CLIU 21, Carbon Lehigh Intermediate Unit here in Pennsylvania, Schnecksville, Pennsylvania. And we are highlighting today our behavioral health program, which, like we say, you know, doesn't get as much uh, award recognition as it deserves. I'm here with Jason Savinelli, and we are here Hi. with Colleen Schenkenberger, which is our outpatient caseworker. How are we today? Hi. Hi, Dominic. Good. Thank you. So... Behavioral health, kids who are struggling on a daily basis, they come to us through the schools, you know, and and our job is to help them through. So how does the CLIU 21 Behavioral Health Program help children learn? That's a good question, Dominic. You know, um, mental health concerns come up for a lot of kids. And when they're coming up for kids, that's going to create problems with school. It's going to create problems at home and with them focusing on their work and sometimes it just gets in the way, you know, so that they can't be successful. Also with our outpatient program that we have, um, we have wonderful therapists and uh, the children meeting with the therapist and them teaching the children, helping them figure out their problems, be able to have somebody as a sounding board is very helpful. We've seen a lot of success stories with our therapists. And then we also have a um, two doctors in our outpatient clinic. We have Dr. Rosowski, we have Dr. Anderson, and then we have Adam Reich. He is our nurse practitioner. All very wonderful. And they are very helpful as well with, with psyche valves, with medication management, helping children become aware of how thing, how the medication can help them, things like that. So as a person who's looking at this from the outside looking in, right, it's just a normal person, because I'm just the cameraman here sometimes and the podcast producer, I wouldn't have expected and what I would perceive as a healthy roster of professionals. Uh, do you think that that's something that people maybe don't expect when they come to us? Like, yeah, we have a doctor, we have an NP. Is that something that you hear and maybe get a little bit of relief from parents? Yeah, absolutely. You know, I, I think that a lot of people don't know that, you know, that we have those services. And so when kids are having those blocks, you know, and we think mental health might be the issue, um, yeah, to go to outpatient. We have three programs in behavioral health, outpatient, IBHS, and partial. And the most kind of broad program is outpatient, the one that Colleen was talking about. And so when a parent, you know, if there's a parent listening, if there, when a parent is confused about what's going on with their child, they don't know what's going on. Uh, they just know something's wrong um, in terms of possible mental health issues. Outpatient is where you go for that kind of help. I mean, you go get an assessment, and we have a doctor, and the doctor says, uh, I'll do an evaluation, you know, and we'll see how we can help and where to go next. And then we make plans for next steps. So so it's lots, It's a great it's a great way to kind of figure out where to go next. And um, if you just don't know what's happening, then that's, that's a good place to start. I have to agree with, with that, Jason, 100%. I know also... In, within the IU, we had some people reach out to us and ask, what exactly do you do? And when I shared with them that we had doctors and we had a nurse practitioner, oh my gosh, they said we, we could refer our, our kids right to you. And I said, absolutely. So that has increased a lot, getting people from within maybe early intervention or whatever, mm -hmm. when it goes mm -hmm. to the next part, they will move on to us. Now, speaking of which, we were talking yesterday, Jason, about how the behavioral health program, whether it's a hospital system or whether it's through CLIU 21, everyone has to do things a little differently. A disturbing number that you said, Jason, was 14% of young girls and 7% of young boys have suicidal tendencies. What, what exactly was that? So we're talking about high school age there, and, and the new statistics from CDC are that 14% of, of high school girls have attempted suicide, so have actually made an attempt, about 7% of boys, so averaging to about 10%, which is overall more than it, it ever was. You know, So here we are post-COVID, and um, you know, it's, it's led me and some others in the field to ask some real questions. You know, uh, we've, been, we've been doing this a long time. We've been providing mental health service, um, and here the suicide rate is worse. You know, and so how can we do some new things? You know, what else can we do? How can we support kids better? You know, what else can we do to kind of help that? You were talking yesterday. Can you speak, speak to this, uh, Colleen, about how we're starting to maybe push our services directly in the school so they can maybe go see someone or talk to someone the same way they just go to a nurse's office to, you know, get Tylenol or something like that? Well, I do know we have we do a lot of school evals. Uh, the school will contact us and ask if we can can do an eval. Uh, so 
we have Dr. Anderson, who basically does all of those. And that is a, a clear cut indicator of what's going on at the schools. Sure, and, sure. And then our doctor will do the evaluation and give her recommendations. And then we follow up with the school and, and follow up with the family as well to make sure that they are getting the, the help that they need. So. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, and and just more in schools, I think that's been, you know, something we've done, something a lot of agencies have done now is more mental health in schools because um, that's one of the new angles. You know, it's one of the new directions we've been able to say, yeah, here's something we can try that maybe will capture kids better. The, the old model is to be in a clinic, like in a separate building, in the community somewhere. And if you're doing that, then, well, a parent has to get the child there. You know, you have to make a separate appointment. If you're in a school, you don't have to do any of that. You know, you can see the child more easily and, and do the assessment. You can pull the parent in on the on the phone. And so, you know, it's just a, it's an easier way to provide the care. And so uh, we've been doing a lot more of that. And other agencies like ours have also been doing more, more of that. I imagine speaking about outpatient case working, these kids are more accessible to you now more than ever. Oh, yeah, absolutely. I was also going to mention our partial programs that we have. I mean, they're just phenomenal, the the people that work in these programs. And, and when a, a child is really struggling, I mean, the collaboration that exists uh, between the IU employees, social workers, psychologists, doctors, everyone, it's, it's just amazing to me how well it works. I wish people could, could understand how it's impressive to me to see how people genuinely care for these kids and get them the help that they need. So I just want to give a shout out to our partial yeah. programs as well. Yeah, thanks, Colleen. Yeah, the, and the partial programs are, are great. They, those are really for kids who have more acuity, who have more struggles. So after they've gone through an outpatient program, after they've tried other things, they may end up in this kind of partial program. But And for the kids who get there, yeah, it really does help them. We, we see some good results. You know, Of course, we have three of our own centers here at the IU, which are special ed schools that we've established through CLIU. And in those centers, we also have partials. So we also have, that means we have therapists, we have the doctor there, mm -hmm. we do the ongoing therapy assessment. It is um, good support we can offer the kids. Aside from just having a bajillion dollars dumped on your department, right? Everyone could use that. <laughs> what's your, what's a struggle that you see societally that makes your job a little more difficult? I mean, everyone wants to point the finger at like Facebook, you know, and, and social media, but. Well, it, I, I feel like, I mean, there's, unfortunately, there's a, a lot of people right now out in our, in this world, in our immediate area that have a lot of mental health issues and it's getting them the help that they need. And, uh, I mean, you're talking about social social media and things like that. I don't know the root cause, but I do know there are a lot of people out there, and we just want to help them. <laughs> mm -hmm. How often, and you know, maybe this is more of an adult thing than a student thing, especially if in school. But do you do you guys see often a first initial appointment made, and it's a no show? Is that is that mm -hmm. common? Because I know among adults it's common, but I don't know if that's common among children, because it is a more controlled environment. Mm -hmm. We, we have a lot of families that are just really stressed. Um, maybe the parents, uh, maybe they're, maybe it's a single parent family. Maybe mm -hmm. they have their own mental health issues. And um, so, yes, we understand um, that it's sometimes hard. So, yes, sometimes they'll have that initial moment where they're like, yeah, we need the help. And then we get to the appointment and, you know, it um, they don't make it, you know. And, and so we, we do reach out. Colleen, mm -hmm. is, Colleen is our person there. She'll reach out a few times yeah. to try to get them in, you know, and, and try to kind of reestablish that contact. With our nurse practitioner, um, Adam Reich and uh, Dr. Rosowski, Audrey Rosowski, um, we've been having about 100% show, though. I mean, once in a while, mm. it might That's drop That's a great down, number. But we've good. been having a 100% show. The time, also, I, I feel where we have problems is a school will reach out to us and say, this child has a lot of problems. So we'll reach out to the family. Um, we will text them. We will email them. We will call them. And we might do it every week for a month. And the family, uh, you know, we're a little busy right now. We'll get back to you. And like Jason said, a lot of these families have some issues of their own that we don't even realize. But we try and we keep calling out to them. And that's what's frustrating, I think, in in my position is, you know, these people need help. And they're they're not reaching out to get the help. And then the schools will help us. So, yeah. Mm -hmm. So what Jason and I were talking about yesterday is this anxiety, depression, suicide crisis. You know, you, you hear it all over the national media, 
podcasts and even local news. And you said that you'd love to just help every single person, right? Is it as bad as maybe it's being perceived? This crisis, anxiety, depression. I I I believe it is. Um, I I mean I've. I've never worked in an outpatient clinic before, but in doing so, I'm realizing there's so many, so many people in the Lehigh Valley that are suffering from this. It seems like since COVID, too, a lot of the times when I'm speaking with the parents, when when the kids were not at school for a while, Mm. they lost a lot of that socialization component. Mm -hmm. And so a lot of the kids are still having issues with that from COVID, of Mm -hmm. of getting back and having socialization with kids. And and then also not blaming social media or anything, but watching the social media, being on the social media, seeing how I'm supposed to be, how I'm not, Mm -hmm. adds a lot of anxiety to these. These kids. Yeah. Well, kids were raised by TikTok there for a minute. Yeah. You know, when you're locked yeah, in your when you're locked indoors for eleven months, twelve months, and that was a yeah. solid twelve months, right? Yeah. That wasn't And you know, they're they're still it's still YouTube and TikTok, but um but you know, when when you when someone's struggling with anxiety, avoiding the thing that causes the anxiety makes it worse. So, you know, in general, when we're doing therapy, you know, we, we do some gradual exposure kinds of things to build tolerance to the thing that's causing the anxiety, and then they kind of get better, it gets easier, you know, over time. So for for youth who have been, who were home for, you know, two years, you know, up to two years in, uh, during COVID, for them to have to return, you know, to things that may make them anxious, you know, that, that was hard, and that, that was, that's, I think that we're still working through, and I think that's probably a little bit about you know, what's causing some of this spike in, mm-hmm. in, in mental health kinds of issues as we gradually move back. Towards. So avoiding things cold turkey is, is actually not the answer. When you're anxious about something. So if, if, okay. I, if, a, if, a, if a young person is anxious about, say, going to school or social involvement or math, whatever it is, their anxiety is only going to get worse if, yeah, if they continue to avoid that. So um, typically we, you know, we coach. Clinically, uh, there's a lot of ways to work through that. You know, one of them might be with medication. If the anxiety is severe enough, Mm -hmm. you know, you might need to have a medication. And therapy will also kind of like help the child gradually walk back towards first with sort of mental imagery, you know, in their mind. Sure. And then eventually towards actual exposure into the actual environment. So, so that's, I think that's just one example, but, but that's, I think that's one way that COVID kind of made all this worse. Like we had mentioned earlier, we have therapists and we have a wait list for therapy because there's just so many looking for therapy. And I mean, if we can't see them, we will refer them out to other providers because we want them to get the help that they need. But definitely, like I said, talking with parents, it seems like COVID was not very helpful. So this is a little bit of a hypothetical. I don't know if you guys can remember to the prehistoric days of 2019 and 2018. You know, mm-hmm. it does feel like a lifetime mm-hmm. away. Our CNI coordinator, Michael Heater, he said when it comes to standardized test scores since COVID, it will take us, I, I really am afraid to even quote this number, but it's going to take us to 2038 to get back to the original standards that mm. we had in 19. Wow. wow. Are you seeing a similar situation where, I mean, in, in 2019, do you, did you think you had a handle on it, you know, in the schools or did COVID, was COVID a reason that we started to do evaluations in school? You know, was there a shift that, you know, did you have to pivot? Yeah, uh, well, I don't know that I really, I know, <laughs> loaded questions. Yeah, sorry. yeah. No, it's, it's a good, I mean, you that's good insight. That. And, and Michael has, uh, has a lot of I don't research. want to call 2038, um, but yeah. it is, it's not great. He, it's in the 30s, I know that. Uh, I would love to see the, what the research suggests in mental health, but I, you know, I think that there's probably never a point where I could have said we got a handle on this mental health thing. I mean, you know, we, I think the way I function in, in mental health a lot is do my homework, do my due diligence, pray, and then hope that you know <laughs> things move forward. Yeah, um, yeah. But it's definitely harder since um, you know since we're back here, uh, since we're back after COVID. So. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. So Joyce Erlinson, she's our outpatient clinic coordinator. Um, she and I basically are in our outpatient program. And some days, we, we, you know, I come in and I'm playing, well, this is what I'm going to do today. I don't even touch that because we have so many calls coming in with people that need help. You're playing and, defense. Yes. Yeah. Oh, that, I like the that. outreach. Yeah. I mean, yes. I know you're outpatient, but yeah. outreach, like you're not <laughs> yeah. out to. They are there. They're calling. And, yeah. and we try, you know, we. Try to get everyone in. Like I said, if we can't, we will send them to other providers just because yeah. they need help. So yeah, IBHS too is similar. You know, um, for autistic, typically for autistic kids, 
but also other kids that are really need the behavioral interventions in the home and the community. You know, and we're doing the home-based work and going out to the schools sometime. Um, there's more demand there than we can mm-hmm. than we can yep. see and can meet. And we, there's just a wait list and everybody. The problem is that it's one thing if it's just us. You know, every provider I know has has a long yeah. wait list in outpatient and IBHS. It's yeah. an ambiguous feeling to know that you're not alone, Yeah. but in yeah. a massive problem. So yeah. it's like, okay, it's not my fault that, you know, it's all mm. happening the way it is. But it's like, man, at least it's not us dropping the ball, so to speak, you know, there's not a ball to drop here. We're doing the best we can. That's what we say every day. You know, we're doing what we can do and we're doing the best we can. So yes. One of the guys I used to know, um, another job used to say that we're starfish savers, you know? So that's just the idea that, you know, that there's the starfish on the beach. We throw back what we can and we help who we can. And if you're asked, you know, you can't save all these, then your response is, I saved that one. Yeah. Yeah. So it's tr- it's true. Yeah, yeah. Well, speaking of, I want to go positive, right? Because I know there's all these problems, but there is a reason why you guys have been in behavioral health for as long as how many years have you been in the field? I've actually have been here in behavioral health for about 24 years, just part time. I yeah. recently have come full t- full time now, so about 24 years. Yeah, you've been, been around. Here. Yeah, yes, yes, in a good way. Yes. Mm-hmm. What I what we'd like to go to towards the end of a podcast is what Dr. Coons calls our small wins and our small W's. And this is all anecdotal evidence, right? Where something happens, whether it's earlier in your career or even just something that happened two weeks ago that makes you keep coming back because, you know, it is the small wins that make life worth it and make your career worth it. So between the two of you, I'd love to give you each an opportunity. Is there a small win or a small W recently, long time ago, five years ago, that made you really say, I'm in behavioral health for a reason, this is where I belong? We had a great success story in Partial recently at um, we had a case uh, with a team meeting, and one of the teams presented this um, case case study. And uh, just in the last month or so, and um, this this young man um, came into Partial. And like I said, it was that really high high level of care, you know. So he had a lot going on. Couldn't sit still in class. Aggressive fighting, you know, breaking things. You know, we got him started in Sites, which is our Partial program. He started with the doctor, got the evaluation, got the meds started with the therapist and we had the follow through at home, you know, so we had the cooperation from the family. They're giving the meds, you know, and that's going well. And the therapist is involved doing regular sessions. And we just saw a huge turnaround with this young man, Um, you know, to his credit now is uh, sitting in his class, doing his work, you know, now we're talking about maybe we don't need to keep him here that much longer. So those are the kind of success stories that, you know, we want to, we want to see. Well, and I used, as I said, I worked in uh, behavior health, IBHS, for about 22 years. What is IBHS? IBHS for? is Intensive Behavioral Health Services. Okay. Because you're not speaking to all professionals out here. There's guys <laughs> like me who have, you know, no clue. Uh, and as Jason mentioned, Thank primarily you. It, it's primarily for autistic children, but other kids, too, who have severe anxiety or issues and need a little extra help one-on-one maybe in the home, in the school. So I used to do that. And that just kept me – it kept me coming back because – even little victories are just huge victories with these families. And uh, I mean, something like a little girl, she was wouldn't get in the car without, you know, scratching and biting her parents and, you know, sitting there and it, it, it took two hours and 45 minutes, but sitting there patiently, calmly just saying, get in the car, get in the car, get in the car. She got in the car. I, it was just a huge victory. That was one that mm. always stays in my mm. mind. But to outpatient services, just the other day, uh, Dr. Rosowski, we were in clinic and she, um, without, you know, obviously you can't, speak because of HIPAA and everything, but we did have a client who was just so excited for their appointment appointment because um, this client, this, um, sorry, individual <laughs> finally got a 96 on their test. And prior to, not saying that medication is the answer, I'm not saying that in all for all children, but in this particular case, this child um, just couldn't focus, couldn't concentrate, was just doing poorly at school. So excited to get on and tell Dr. Rosowski that they got a 96. You know, it was a really good clinic appointment. When Dr. Rosowski hung up the phone, she said, that is that is why I'm here. That is why I'm coming here. And it, it yeah. just made me feel so good yeah, to be great. part of this, you know. We also had an, another client who right out said, you know, I just, I just want to give you a hug because I feel finally that I can focus and I'm concentrating and I'm doing well and my anxieties are, are doing better. So it's when you hear little stories like that, which are huge stories, that's what keeps me coming back to be able to yeah, help somebody yeah. truly. 
you know, behavioral health is sometimes one of those problems if it's in your family that you don't quite know what to do. Mm. If your kid has a stomach ache, you go to the ER. If a kid's having depression or anxiety, you don't, there's not an ER for that, so right. to speak, right? Mm. So for someone out there who has a cousin or a brother or a or child, you know, someone that they know, even if it's a friend or a neighbor, what would you tell someone who, who thinks to themselves, I need to seek out behavioral health services? I mean, we, we do have, I wish we brought the numbers. The, we have crisis numbers that people can call in Northampton County, in uh, mm. Lehigh County, Carbon County. Mm. There's different phone numbers that they can call. But definitely don't ever doubt somebody when they're telling you something and mm-hmm. if they're reaching out to you. Get them help, the help that they need. You can call, you know, the hospital. You can call Kids Pieces. They have a, a, a walk-in service program. Of course, call the IU because, you know, we can definitely help you there. But don't take anything lightly and reach out for help. Yeah, I mean, if you're a parent listening, you know, then you may feel like, you know, some of the issues you're seeing with your child and you're just maybe feeling a little overwhelmed. Maybe you don't know exactly where to go next. You know, I mean, I think the the outpatient evaluation, you know, something we can do within the course of a couple of weeks, you know, if you give us a call and just getting that evaluation done so that you can um, maybe have a little more peace of mind and and just kind of see if, if, you know, if maybe you're feeling like it's not so bad, but I'd like to get it checked, you know, and then so you can get our our perspective on it, you know, the doctor will take a look and and give their, their thoughts. And so that could be helpful. Okay. And can I just add about Project Aware before we finish Let's up? Let's go. Like, do it. Project, yeah. So, you know, we, we talked about, you know, the new kind of exciting things we have to offer because of coming out of this crisis and feeling like we need to do some things. Well, we've got this three IUs in four counties. We have a grant called Project Aware. It's coming out of the federal level, federal government. And we're doing all kinds of things. We're offering to the school a bunch of different things. So we're offering universal screening, which is the ability to screen all students in a certain grade or in their school or however the school wants to do it for suicide, you know, to make sure to catch those kind of kids that, you know, might not be safe and we don't know it. We're also offering a suicide prevention training. We're supporting, uh, called SOS. We're supporting a student group called Avitum, which is an amazing group. It's a student group where students take the lead in promoting mental wellness in their school, and we're developing leaders in that. These are all partnerships. We're also promoting this findhelp.org, findhelp.org, which is which is a new, it's the next generation of search site, search okay. website for mental health treatments. You can search for um, a, a service and you can send it right to the parent. If you're a provider, you can go in there and you can you can own and update your own card. So you can like, you can find your card. So I find my CLIU card and then I claim it and then I can edit it. So I don't have to wait for someone else to edit it. And then yeah, sure. you know, it doesn't go out of, you know, it doesn't go out of date or whatever. Um, and then I just can do it monthly. So lots of things are offering, very exciting. We could probably do a whole podcast just on Project sound, Aware, Dominic, like if you ever feel like it. Um, so anyway, but it's very exciting uh, stuff. And then, you know, kind of some of the stuff that we're trying to shake out of the box and say, you know, what can we do that's new? And then what can we do that, that was always great that we need to keep doing? And I think about people like Colleen and Joyce. I'm thinking about the stuff that we've always done well because they have good relationships with people. And they reach out and do all that work, you know, so that kind of stuff is what we need to keep doing as well. Well, Colleen, you were a nice surprise today. Thank oh. you so much for coming on. Jason, Thank we talked you. about this for a Thank week. You. Thank you both so much for coming on. Yeah. This was the Helping Children Learn podcast, season two, episode six. You can stream this on Apple Music, Spotify, Amazon, Google Podcasts, Pandora, and also you can watch this in closed captioning if you are deaf or hard of hearing on our Facebook page. So Colleen, Jason, thank you so much for coming on. Thank you, Dominic.